Hello again. I hope that you're well, both physically and mentally. I don't know about you guys, but I'm starting to go a little stir crazy. It's not a good sign when you're really looking forward to your, quote, essential grocery shopping trip. Today, we're in lesson two of our study of the epistle to the Romans. I'll be reading from the ESV translation. If you'd prefer to read your own translation, just pause the video until you find it and then continue. When Karen and I travel to see our son and daughter-in-law in Fort Worth, there are several different ways we can go. Of course, we're a little unique living on a peninsula. If you're giving someone directions to almost anywhere from here, it always starts with get on Walden Road and go straight for five miles and then turn left or right on 105. But after the t left turn or right turn, you have a choice about your route. We can go up I-45 through Madisonville or Highway 6 to I-35 through Waco. And even after we decide between I-35 and I-45, there are many other choices that we can make about the exact route, and that's generally true of any highway travel of any length. One way may be better than the other this time because of construction or traffic, but they all generally get you there. That's not the same when we talk about salvation. Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. There's only one path that leads to salvation, and that's Jesus. That's what Paul is going to explain to the churches of Rome, beginning with today's verses. Paul desired to preach the gospel to all people, Jew and Gentile alike. That gospel begins with all people understanding they are guilty of sin. Only then can they appreciate the gift of Christ. Paul began this message at the end of last week's lesson in verses 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Some translations in verse 17 use a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, or faith from beginning to end. The proposition is that God's plan of justification is revealed in the gospel. To make this obvious to everyone, it's necessary for Paul to show that all other plans have failed. And there's a need for some new plan or scheme to save mankind. He devotes the rest of this chapter and the two next chapters to this idea. Paul first needs for them to understand that all people are sinners and in need of redemption. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. The word begins with the word for. The word denotes that the apostle is about to give a reason for what he had just said in verse 17, namely that God's plan of justification is revealed in the gospel. The wrath of God is revealed in, from heaven. When you see wrath of God, it's easy to apply human emotions to God's wrath. When we talk about a person's wrath, we think of someone who's been wronged and is seeking vengeance, something born out of emotion and anger. But when we think of God's wrath, we have to remove any thought of human passion, especially the passion of revenge. God cannot be injured by sin. He has no motive for vengeance. In communicating the gospel, we have to use words that people use and understand, but it only follows that when we use these words to talk about God, they may not mean precisely the same thing. In this case, the wrath of God would denote God's divine displeasure or indignation against sin and his determination to inflict punishment in response. The verse says that the wrath of God is revealed. How has it been revealed? It's been revealed to the Jews by the law through the Old Testament. It's been revealed to the Gentiles through their reason and conscience, as Paul will illustrate shortly. The verse says that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. If you read this literally, you might think that the wrath of God will be sent from heaven or that the heavens declare his wrath. 
Most likely, this just means that God's divine displeasure against sin is made known by divine means, whether that be the law which the Jews had or through the works of creation. Because sin expresses itself in contrast to God's righteous character, no one who is unsaved can avoid encountering the wrath of God. I don't know about you guys, but thinking about the wrath of God makes me more than a little uncomfortable. It's much easier to focus on his love and compassion. But God's wrath also articulates his love. If he let us continue in the destructive path of sin, he would not be demonstrating love. His action seeks to turn us away from sin, which leads to death. The verse says the wrath of God is revealed, quote, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. When he says all ungodliness, Paul is calling out all men for refusing to honor God and neglecting to worship him. The unrighteousness of men refers to man's iniquity toward his fellow man, whether that be neighbor, parent, or stranger. All ungodliness would include all crimes against God, and unrighteousness would include all crimes against our fellow men. The verse says, quote, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Although some people can ignore their reactions to God's convicting spirit, most have an innate sense of good and evil. Even people that were never exposed to Scripture have a remedial understanding of right and wrong. While we often try to rationalize or explain away our sin, our conscience continues to tug away at us. Verse 19. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Paul says that what can be known about God is plain to them. This statement implies that there are many things concerning God that cannot be known to us, which shouldn't be a surprise. It'd be like an amoeba trying to understand Einstein's law of relativity. But the verse also says that we can understand what we can understand about God should be plain to us. Consequently, every person has enough knowledge of God to understand what is wrong because sinful activity contrasts so starkly with the rightness of God. Verse 20, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Paul says that God's eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived by man ever since the creation of the world. The verse says these things, quote, have been clearly perceived. The King James Version says these things are clearly seen. The Greek word that's translated perceived or seen means to literally look down and see from above, to view from on high, and hence to see thoroughly perceive clearly and understand. Paul's saying there's no missing this. God's eternal power and divine nature aren't something that you're going to overlook. Beginning when he spoke the world into being, God demonstrated his eternal power through his creation. Even as early humans gazed up into the starry nights or marveled at the majesty of this earth, they could not help but acknowledge the might of the creator. That is evident from our study of, you know, almost all ancient civilizations. Virtually all of them recognized a greater power at work. They may have worshipped the sun or some random idol, but they knew that there was someone greater than them. The perfection of creation couldn't be random chance. It had to be the result of a grand designer. Certainly, the Jewish people accepted that God revealed himself in creation, But the Gentiles at the time knew it as well. Greek Stoic philosophers saw traces of divine design in all of nature and especially in the human mind. Even today, reasonable people are forced to admit God's qualities are clearly seen and understood through what he's made in creation. In the verse, Paul says, quote, so they are without excuse. Because they have perceived these things, they are without excuse when they are held accountable for sin. We only have one option, to acknowledge our accountability before God and seek his forgiveness. Verse 21. 
For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. When we're confronted with the reality of God's righteousness, sinful people only have two choices. We can accept God as he reveals himself and repent, or we can reject him and look for a substitute. <clears throat> Perhaps a substitute does not make us feel as guilty. Through God's creation and the revelation of Scripture, those of us that are honest with ourselves have to acknowledge they know God at some level. Even knowing this, Paul spoke of people who desired to continue in sin, and they did not honor God or give him thanks. As an aside, the Roman culture at this time was generally obsessed with honor, and failure to give thanks to a benefactor was deemed reprehensible. Because of their failure to honor God, the verse says that, quote, they became futile in their thinking. The King James Version says they became vain in their imaginations. To become vain means to be elated or self-conceited or to seek praise from others. The meaning here seems to be that they became foolish, frivolous with their thoughts and ability to reason. They acted foolishly and employed themselves in useless and frivolous questions the result being that their mind was led further and further away from the truth regarding God. Self-centered minds reject God's truth in favor of whatever validates their personal desires. The verse says, quote, their foolish hearts were darkened. The Greek word translated darkened means to deprive of light, to make dark. When sinners remain unrepentant, their hearts are darkened. They lose the ability to perceive or discern what is true. We look at this verse in total, there are four things to take up away from it. Number one, the people had the knowledge of God. Number two, they refused to honor him when they knew him and were opposed to his character and governance. Number three, they were ungrateful. And four, they began to doubt, to reason, to speculate, and as a result, wandered far into the darkness. Verse 22 and 23, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. <clears throat> Even though the Roman Empire reigned over much of the known world, this was still a time when Greek philosophy was very popular. The works of Socrates, Aristotle, and Plato were still on people's minds, and they would have long philosophical conversations trying to convince each other how smart they were. Being perceived as wise, like these philosophers, was very desirable in the culture at the time. The word philosopher actually means lover of wisdom. These people probably considered themselves to be the intellectual superior of people that believe in God. In reality, they've simply confirmed the judgment that they are indeed fools. Psalms chapter 14, verse 1 says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Verse 23 says, I quote, Exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. The word exchange doesn't mean that they literally transmuted God himself, but rather that in their views, they changed him or they exchanged him as an object of worship for idols. This produced no real change in the glory of God. The change was in themselves. They forsook God, who from verse, from verse 21, we know that they knew, and offered homage, which was due to God, to idols instead. Idolatry offers one example of the foolishness mentioned in the previous verse. Since humans can't repudiate the majesty of creation, they have to find a replacement for God that allows them to continue with sin without feeling condemnation. As a result, they have exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images of created things. If they acknowledged the glory and reality of God, they would have to bow in submission to him. Instead, they come up with a cheap substitute made with their own hands. Instead of man created in God's image, they bow to gods created by man's imagination. In this way, things of the creation, rather than the creator, become the object of their worship. 
The verse says that they cast images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. The Greeks and Romans depicted their major deities in human form. Interestingly, they ridiculed the Egyptians for portraying many deities as animals or part animals. I do have to chuckle at the irony of one group of idol worshipers making fun of another group of idol worshipers. It conjures up images of kids snidely saying, my idol is better than yours. Today, our generation's idols might be money, power, or popularity. Paul is saying that re rejecting God's truth leads to darkness and foolishness. We need to learn from past mistakes and seek the light of God rather than remain in the darkness of worldliness. Verse 24 and 25. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. <clears throat> Bad decisions usually have negative consequences, sometimes severe consequences. When sinful people refused to acknowledge God, he gave them up to what they sought. One of the desires of their hearts involved impurity. Not all sin involves sexuality, but immorality often characterizes people who seek to satisfy their own cravings rather than honor God. The verse says, quote, the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. This refers to the way they dishonored God by shamelessly engaging in sexual sin. When the truth about God condemned their desire, sinful humanity exchanged it for a lie. Just as Adam and Eve didn't believe God in Eden, the people of Rome tended to follow whatever allowed them to continue in sin. Human nature yearns to worship something beyond ourselves. When people rejected God, they worshiped and served the creator or creation and its desires rather than the creator. At the end of verse 25, Paul interjected a personal note of devotion to the Lord. He says that the God is the one who should be blessed forever. He alone is worthy of worship and adoration. He alone should direct our affections and actions. And with an exultant amen, Paul declared it to be so. Verse 26 and 7. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. Continuing the example of how depravity expresses itself in immoral behavior, Paul described the reason and the ways God gave them up. The phrase, quote, for this reason, refers back to the issue of false worship mentioned in the previous verse. Paul says that they were given up to, quote, dishonorable passions. The King James Version says vile affections. The improper attitude of people toward God resulted in corrupt relationships with one another. They came under the control of what Paul says were dishonorable passions. The word dishonorable describes not only the degrading lust that they gave into, but also the dishonor brought upon the sinner. The verses say, quote, for their women exchange natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise give up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men. It seems clear that Paul is referring to homosexuality in these verses. We've talked before about Roman culture and sexuality and the word hedonism or hedonistic. It's a philosophy started by Aristippus, a student of Socrates around 400 BC. Boiled down, the philosophy says that pleasure or happiness is the highest good, and by extension, anything that brings you pleasure or happiness is also good. In our modern day culture, the 60s version of that would be, if it feels good, do it. Roman sexual attitudes and behaviors around this time are shocking to us today and would have differed enormously from those in letter Western societies or Judaism at the time. Let's consider just a few things. For starters, prostitution was legal and very widespread. What we would consider pornographic paintings were prominently featured 
among the art collections or wall frescoes in respectable upper-class households. It was considered natural and very unremarkable for Roman men to have sexual relationships with teenage youths of both sexes, and this pederasty was condoned as long as the younger partner was not a freeborn Roman. In fact, <clears throat> Romans didn't separate sexuality into categories of heterosexual or homosexual to the point that there are no equivalent Latin words for these two concepts. There was nothing keeping a Roman man from enjoying sex acts with either women or males of inferior status, whether prostitutes or people like servants or slaves. Verse 27 ends with, quote, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. One thing that's certain is you cannot disregard God without consequences. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. Sin of any kind results in death. But Paul could have been alluding to this sexual sin carrying an additional effect on their bodies. An obvious interpretation of this penalty could refer to sexually transmitted diseases, which at the time could have been fatal. Verse 28, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Paul again emphasizes that God gave them up. Repeatedly, these verses portray how God gave them up to what they desired. These sinful people continually refused to acknowledge God. Accordingly, God gave them over to a debased mind. The King James Version says God gave them over to a reprobate mind. The Greek word translated debased or reprobate means something not standing the test, rejected, or cast away. Denying the wisdom of God, they were left with a reprobate mind that sees good as bad and bad as good. Rejecting God can lead to the devaluing of all life. These people have no regard for their own lives, much less the people they use in their sinfulness. Instead of showing genuine love for others, they selfishly seek only to satisfy their lusts. Verse 32, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. The King James Version starts verse 32 with, quote, who knowing the judgment of God. The week's lesson began with evidence that every person has enough revelation to know the righteous nature of God. Each person should be aware of what is right and wrong, as well as the consequences of sin. God's righteous decree or the judgment of God is the wages of sin or death. The verse says, quote, who practice such things deserve to die. Not death at the hand of a local magistrate, but deserving punishment by God's hand. The problem with unrepentant sinners is not that they do not know God's just sentence. Rather, they just don't care. They don't think that God is worthy of their consideration. They not only practice sinful acts, they give approval to those who practice them, and in reality, bring others into their sinful acts. The sins that Paul mentioned in the verses above cannot be committed alone. They require others. None of us would argue that today's society thinks biblical ethics are overbearing and believe God's justice is too harsh. In reality, people who parade their wickedness in front of all who would watch illustrate the deceptive nature of sin. One only has to watch various media personalities to see people who flaunt their sin, because having other people join in their wrongdoing seems to validate their behavior. They encourage other people to do the same. They ignore the reality that refusing to honor God justifies a sentence of death. Instead of seeing God's discipline as an, an expression of his love, their sinful minds substitute sensuality for love. In the end, of course, God's righteousness will prevail. Only those who repent and seek forgiveness in Christ will find God's redeeming love. Next week, we'll discuss lesson three. The main theme for that lesson is, since no one can keep the law perfectly, everyone needs a Savior. The study verses for next week's lesson are Romans chapter 2, verses 17 through 29. If you don't have a study guide yet and you'd like one, they're available at the church. 
To ensure that someone's there when you go to pick it up, I would suggest calling beforehand. Now let me leave you with a prayer. Father God, even as we shelter in place because of this virus, we praise your name. We would ask you to bless us during this continuing crisis. We ask that you protect us and not only keep us safe, but give us wisdom, empathy, kindness, and most of all, peace, which only you can do. We ask that you allow us to come back together soon so that we can rekindle our fellowship and worship together. All these things we ask in your name. Amen.